And so if you will, uh, take your Bibles and let's go to the book of John. Book of John. And we're going to read starting in verse 37 of chapter 7. So John chapter 7, 37. 7, 37. Everybody got it? And on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And Lord, I pray that this message is given with your spirit, and may your word be rightly divided. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I don't know if you guys keep up with local news at all uh, here in the Modesto area. If anybody gets the Modesto B, it seems like less and less people are getting the Modesto B. Um, or I don't know if you've been watching the local TV news stations. I know most, most of the time I'm just watching national politics, so I'm watching the national channels. Um, and so I don't get to see, I don't watch the news much from, that comes out of Sacramento. So I don't know if you guys get your local news from Sacramento, the TV stations, or if you get it from the Modesto Bay. If you don't, just maybe you don't get it at all. And you're just, you're, you're kind of like most of America, you're interested in the big picture of politics. Uh, but uh, it, it, in case you haven't, there's been a, a pretty large happening, um, a government issue that is... Re it's flown under the radar, but it's really huge. It's really significant in our region. And that has to do with <clears throat> the California Water Board, which is selected by uh, the governor. And they're wanting to release gobs of water, tons of acre feet of water, down the river during the winter and the spring to help the salmon populations come back. Because they're, they're down to just a small percentage of what they used to be. And then, the, of course, using this water, pushing it into the delta so that there's more fresh water in the delta. There's a minnow there they call the delta smelt. And it's almost extinct. And they're trying to, they're trying to conserve these, these, these species. And I don't say that there's anything wrong with that. Um, you know, we're, God has given us dominion over this world, right? But he's, he's also given us a little bit of common sense. But what this water board wants to do is take the, the levels. Now, I live on the river. I live on the Tuolumne River. So I see the, the amount of water that's let out of Don Pedro Dam. And they keep the water running all year round. But what they want to do is run the river, they say, at 50% of the normal level before the dam existed. Um, at Don Pedro. And so tons and tons of water are going to be coming out and to help these fish. And the only problem is it's, it's going to hurt the farmers because these farmers need this water, right, to use for their crops. And of course, there's 40 million people here in California that need the water to drink. And, and this water, but these, these uh, people want to use this water to help the salmon and help the minnows. And, uh, and so there's a really big war going on but for, for this water. You know, used to, in the old days, it was the water rights where the north, northern state of California would fight the southern state of California for these water rights, and now we're all fighting against the fish. And so we've got this giant mess on our hands, and, you know, it got me to thinking about this whole system, and, of course, I like to dig, I'm like that, I like to dig into history and find out more about everything, and... You know, these, these actions that this government group is taking um, has to do with a massive reservoir system. I know a lot of us, you know, some of us may think, oh, we just have lakes. You know, we got Modesto Reservoir, we got this Turlock Lake, we got the Don Pedro Lake. Well, these lakes didn't exist over 100 years ago. They, they weren't there. Because we have this massive reservoir system all up and down the state. From Northern California to Southern California, we have these huge reservoir systems back in the 1800s after the initial gold rush in 1849 uh, President Ulysses S. Grant saw this population increase in California and so he sent um, one of his surveyors uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers to determine how to provide for the water needs of this state because California was becoming part of the Union so they needed to figure out we've got all these people flooding into California 
How's California going to provide food and water for all these 49ers, for all these people that went in for the gold and all the people that followed them to provide the services for these gold miners? How are we going to provide water for them? And so that's what happened. Um, they went in um, to survey what was happening. The problem with California was it, unlike in the east and the south where the rains begin in the spring and go throughout the fall, here it starts in late fall, goes all winter, uh, into early spring, and so you couldn't get any crops to grow here because all the rains came in the winter, in the winter. And what ended up happening was all that snow that would accumulate up in the mountains in the Sierras in the spring would just come flooding down. I mean, if you ever look, um, you know, again, I get to see this in Waterford, where our house is, there's this giant ravine. We are in a ravine where once upon a time, when the floods would happen, when the snow would melt from the, from the mountains, the water would come down and flush out this giant ravine and would send out all this water and then it would dry up because the snow would disappear. And so the Army Corps of Engineers had to try to figure out what can we do about this because the water would come down into the valley and it would create this giant marshland. If you ever go to Newman or San Luis area, there's this giant wetland still that's in existence. Well, that's how the valley used to be all over. It was all this giant wetland where birds would come and flock and this is where they would nest. And what you see today in California is nowhere near where it was 100, 150 years ago. So the Army Corps of Engineers sent this information back to President Grant and, uh, and brought this information back, but the, it was never really acted on. The, pro, the technology probably wasn't there, neither was the money after the Civil War had happened. So it wasn't until the 1930s and the 40s that anything began to be done with all these reservoirs. And we have almost 100 reservoirs that we have built in California since this time. But under the Giants, the Giant Works program, anybody remember FDR? Who remembers FDR here? A few of you <laughs> were around. Okay. You gotta go way back. If you if you remember FDR, you got some gray in your hair, all right? So what he would do, what they did during the Great Depression is this giant government works program. So the government was putting people to work because there weren't any jobs. So they decided, okay, we're gonna build infrastructure in America. And so what had happened is he started pouring money into these giant government works program and into the infrastructure of California. Um, and they had the task of building a series of dams in the Sierras back in the 1930s and 40s. Now, it would take decades before many of the dams that we, uh, that we see as a part of our daily lives today uh, were, would, uh, would be built, including Don Pedro, which is the big one here in our area. That wasn't built until 1970. And so it took 100 years from the time Ulysses S. Grant took a look at this area to the time Don Pedro, this giant dam that with a giant reservoir of water was actually built. A hundred years. And so, you're probably starting to wonder, Chris, is this going to be nothing but a history lesson for me? Are we going back to eighth grade and learning about the history of California? And uh, if you haven't put it together yet, like most of my messages, we're going to look at this system of water that we have put in place here in California and find out how our lives are similar to this great public works, this great reservoir system that we have in California. And hopefully, by understanding that correlation between the water system and our lives, we can be better servants for God. Okay? That's the whole point of all my messages. I'm going to take this, compare it with this, and make you a better person, a better Christian, a better servant of God. All right? Okay? Let's go. Ready? Ready. Mm. Okay, so we're going to start looking at why these dams were built all over California. That's what we're going to look at. Because there's more than one reason that they were built. More than just one reason. So let's take a look at all these reasons this evening and we'll apply them to our lives. So the first thing first reason that the reservoir system was built in California. They were built to provide a sustainable and predictable source of water for residents, all right? So if you're taking notes, I got four points for you, all right? So number one, 
They were built to provide a sustainable and predictable source of water for the residents of California. Now, we look at this water system and, and, and the whole point of putting a dam up is to catch the water and put it behind that wall and save it for when we need it. And in our own lives, we have places where we store our money, right? We call them banks. So the income comes in, and some of us these days have direct deposits, so we never even see the check. It just goes directly from our business to our account at the bank. And that bank has the money, and when we need to use the money to pay a house bill, to pay a visa bill, to pay the car payment, we write a check or we enter some information online, and that money that's in this reservoir, this bank, is distributed when we need it to the people who we're supposed to pay, right? So that's how a bank works. Well, just like a bank works, that's what the reservoirs do. They store the water that we need for now until the time that we need it. Otherwise, guess what? If those dams weren't there, the water would just flow out and we'd never be able to need it when we need it. When the summer came and the snowpack is all gone, and we need to water our crops, the farmers need to water the crops, or you need enough water to go flush, <laughs> it wouldn't be there because there wouldn't be any water. It's just a bunch of river, rivers heading to the delta and heading to the ocean. But that's what the reservoir system's for, is to hold that water for a time when we need it. And that is how we are in our spiritual lives, in our Christian walk. You see, we store up the things that God gives us. We store up the things that God would have us know and have us believe. Like a real reservoir, we have to start with a source that fills us up. So guess what? You're filling up right now. You're filling up your reservoir right now, right where you're sitting. Because every time you come to church, every time you come to Sunday school, Every time you come to a Bible study on Wednesday, every time you open up your Bible at home, every time you spend some time in prayer with God, you are filling up your spiritual reservoir with the things of God. Now, right now in California, we all know that we've been going through a drought for the last four or five years. We had a pretty good winter last winter that helped us out, but it didn't get us out because we were so far behind. You know, if you go... Uh, our lakes and reservoirs were close to empty this time of year, uh, a year ago. If you go up to New Maloney's, I couldn't believe it. Every time I would drive by where that water, I, if you've ever driven over that bridge that goes out to, what is that, towards Mariposa um, from Turlock, that water would just be right up to the bridge because it was controlled by the dam to make it a perfect flow. And it was just dry and icky and it was a muddy old swamp and that's that's where california's been for the past four or five years because we haven't had enough water our reservoirs have been nearly empty and why is that it's because the source of the water had stopped the source of what was filling the reservoirs had stopped coming in to fill them up hello are you getting about what I'm, what I'm about to say? There are times in our lives when we go through spiritual droughts in our life. When we aren't filling up our reservoirs, right? When we aren't letting God fill up our lives with His goodness. When our connection with God is dangerously low. It's because we, we aren't allowing the source when we aren't allowing the source to fill up our lives. And let me tell you, man, can I feel it when I'm not allowing the source to fill up my life. And maybe I'm in church, and, but maybe I haven't had time to read the Bible or pray this week or this month. And man, I could feel it when that source has dried up because my reservoir is getting dangerously low. And if you spend time away from your Bible, if you spend time away from church, it catches up with you. And you know this. And you felt it probably in your own life. 
You felt it. And so many people that I've talked to, there's a lot of people that come to me uh, from time to time with some problems in there. Chris, you go to church, you know, at work, or just friends. And Chris, you go to church. Chris, you're a minister. And they'll explain their problem to me. And I think, I start thinking to myself, you know, if your reservoir was full, if you had been in touch with the source and filling up your reservoir with godliness, you probably wouldn't have been in this particular situation. Right? You know, and we have problems all the time. When they could have been, sometimes they're uh, work problems, sometimes they're family problems, financial problems. But when they bring these issues to me, I think to myself, either number one, you probably would not have been in this problem if your reservoir would have been full. If you would have allowed the source to come into your life. Or two, yes, maybe that problem exists no matter how much time you spend in prayers, no matter how much time you spend in the Word. Sometimes health problems come into our lives, no matter how much time we spend with God. But aren't you glad that when you have spent all this time with God and that problem comes along, your reservoir is full and you're ready to take on that challenge. And that challenge is difficult, right? It is so difficult, but you are filled up with the goodness of God and you are ready to face that problem. Let your reservoir be filled with the goodness and the fullness of of God. You know, the world can fill you up with a lot of things, but it doesn't fill you up like the source does, like God does. And when you fill your life up with good things, with godly things, then your reservoir is truly filled. And when that problem comes into your life, oh man, you're ready for it. All right. All right, number two. Number two. The second reason these dams were created was for flood control for the valley. And like I said earlier, this valley was a marshland. I, I, I've often heard Dad talk about in the old days, man, we used to have the worst fog you'd ever see. I mean, we have fog. Of course, you know, nobody likes to drive through fog, and sometimes it gets thick. But I remember the stories. He would tell me, man, the fog would be so thick, and it would be thick all the time. And the reason is, well, we didn't have any all, all these huge reservoirs stopping up the water, so the water was just continually flowing into the whole valley and spreading out. And, and instead of being relegated to some orchard areas, it was just sitting in this swamp. And that water would come up and create more tule fog here in the valley. And of course, we know the valley, the fog can't get out. So that moisture would... But that's how much water there used to be. And there used to be these massive floods. You know, when we have great years of of uh, snow, guess what? It fills those reservoirs up. Before the reservoirs exist, where did that water go? Right where you're sitting. <laughs> it would fill up the valley. It would go everywhere. Uh, in the winter of 1956 and spring of 57, there was this devastating flood that hit the Central Valley from Sacramento all the way down to nearly Fresno. And uh, it hit, hit California because too much rain and too much snow and too much warm weather at the same time came and just melted that snow, filled up this valley. There were floods everywhere. And with no flood controls in place, none of the dams had been built from Sacramento down to Merced that are in existence today. The whole area came under this massive flooding in 1956, 1957. And Dad, I want to say that I think you've actually had some home video of uh, when, when your parents had shot that, when Riverbank, the the, river, the the roads looked like rivers. They looked like canals. The roads were so full of water. And, uh, you know, back in those days, you remember how they used to build the homes? They didn't build them directly on foundations, did they? You can tell because when you're in an older home, especially one that's built pre-1970, when you walk, it sounds like this. Because it's a hollow floor, because underneath is that space for when the floods come, you don't run the entire house. That's why they built it that way. And so, when these floods would come, and especially this particular flood, um, it ended up killing 64 people. 64 people in a flood that covered the entire valley from Sacramento. If you saw the pictures, it, was just, it just looks awful where homes are completely underwater. And at that particular time, they were trying to get what's called the Central Valley Project. The Central Valley Project was where they were going to build a series of dams 
from the in the Sierras, from the, around the Sacramento East area, all the way down um, past Merced. And so they wanted to build this. They were trying to get it on the ballot. Well, after this flood happened, um, the federal government appropriated some money to come down to, to put in place for this cataclysmic event that had happened in the Central Valley. And so before they could even pass, now, believe me, the next election, everybody was saying, yes, let's, pla this, let's pass this bill and let's get these dams built so that we don't have this kind of flood again. But before that could even pass, the, tw the $25 million, which was a lot of money back then, was already pouring into California. And so they were already starting to build these dams up in the Sierras for flood control. That's what they were trying to do, to, so that something like this would not happen again. And of course, now that we've been here, as, as long as I've been here, I've only seen one sort of kind of flood, and that was back in 1960, and then 1996, 97 winter, when we had a bunch of snow and the warm rain came in and melted it. And uh, now the houses that were closer to the river were, were facing some flood damage. Where, where my house now is, is in a, one of those, it's called a 30 year flood plain. And so if that type of flood were to happen again, which is why I have flood insurance these days, it, it would wipe out some of those low lying homes. But it didn't touch any of this neighborhood because the dams are in place. So even with a cataclysmic type of, um, of flood, it didn't affect the valley, only a few homes that were built in these designated floodplains. And so it's just a dangerous place to live when, when floods. That's isn't that great news um, for us. Um, so that's why these dams were built. That's the number two reason for flood control so that homes and crops and businesses weren't washed away and people would not die from these floods. Number two reason. That's why these were built. And I'll say this, it's amazing that today, with all the technology that we have, right? We have so much science and so much technology. It is simply incredible that with all this technology, our weather is still unpredictable. We still can't figure it out. We still, we, I mean, we claim we know what's causing global warming. We claim we know what's causing climate change. But we can't figure out 100% if it's going to rain next week. Right? So we're trying, we say we can predict something that's going to happen 10 years from now, 50 years from now, and we can't tell if it's going to rain or be sunshiny on Saturday. So we have all this technology and we can't get there. Or we can't even tell if it's going to be a wet winter or if it's going to be a dry winter. They were saying last winter was going to be a horrendous winter. With El Nino coming through, we were going to get just a ton of water. And we ended up getting about normal on average i think they said 98 99 percent of the amount of rain and the amount of snow it was just an average year they predicted a heavy year so they're, they're, they're trying to predict this winter they have no idea what's coming it's so unpredictable the weather life is a lot like the weather amen Sometimes a lot of life comes your way in a hurry. Hmm? Sometimes we have those massive floods where lots of life, or it, it just piles up on top of us. And have you ever been so overwhelmed by life that you thought you were going to drown in it? There's been just so much that you just... You can't figure out how you're going to get it. I would, I would say we've all gone through that. And my guess is there's a lot of us here that have gone through it in the last week, the last month, or the last year, where life has overwhelmed us so much that we're, we think we're going to drown in this life. But God builds up shields of protection for us. He builds these protections in our lives. God helps control the floods in our lives. There are times in my life that I can easily look back and say, if God was not in my life, if I had not spent so much time with God before this horrible event happened in my life, I wouldn't have made it. I would have broken. 
I would have had a nervous breakdown. I'd be a wreck. I'd be a horrible person to live with. It would have messed me up. But I know that God has put in that dam in my life. He has put in that protection, that shield, so that when the floods of life come my way, He is protecting me. Isaiah says that at times the enemy will come in like a flood. Right? You guys familiar with that verse? It says the enemy will come in like a flood. But what's the rest of the verse say? God will lift up a standard against him. Amen. And I was looking in some commentary about that um, from 500 years ago, <laughs> amazingly. And the commentary said, while the original Hebrew of this doesn't make sense on what they're trying to say when God rose up a standard, by comparing it to all the scriptures around what Isaiah was saying here, clearly what he was trying to say is that God was building a dam against the floods. I thought, whoo, boy, I'm on the right track. You know, because God will build up a standard. He will put up a standard again when the enemy comes against your life. And believe me, if he hasn't lately, he's going to. You know why? You're in church. And you're trying to do something for God. So guess what the enemy's going to do? He's going to send people along. He's going to send bad stuff at your work along. He's going to send health problems along. He's going to try to overwhelm you. And he's going to try to flood you out. And he's going to try to drown you. But the Spirit of God will lift up a standard against him when he comes against you. Amen. And that is what God is for us. He builds up a dam for us. It's not just to hold, up all, hold in all the good things in our life and to fill up our reservoirs and to fill up our lives with good things. But he builds this structure to keep the floods from overwhelming us. Amen. The third reason these dams were created is to create electricity for the valley. Right? They don't just put up a wall and, well, everything. No, they took advantage of the situation. Because guess what? What direction does water always go? Downhill. It's always going to go to the point of least resistance. And so they build up these giant cement structures and the water's trying to get through. So what they put in it? Just a little port to let the water come through? No, they have these giant turbines inside the dam that when the water comes through, like it does today, like it does all the time. Have you ever thought about that? That river, just the water just keeps on going through, and then at 10 o'clock they turn it off. No. It just keeps going through. The water just keeps flowing through. And while it is flowing through, those turbines are creating electricity. And when we flick on our lights, that's where... Did you know that in MID and TID, close to 30% of their electricity in their grid comes from the dams up in the Sierras? 30%. That's a lot. Now, if those didn't exist, well, we'd have to do... I mean, we'd have to have more nuclear facilities or we'd have to have coal-burning facilities to create this electricity. But instead, we have these structures that create electricity for free. That's nice, you know? It just comes through because the water's coming through. As the snow melts, it pushes water through, and we have all this electricity, all this power from the structure. That's number one, it's there to, to, for, for our water source. Number two, it's there for flood control. But number three, it's, it's creating energy. It's creating power for those of us who live in the valley. You see, when we fill up with the source, let's go back to our lives. When we fill up with the source, we begin taking in the good things of God. Right? So the good things of God are coming into our reservoir. Now, let me say this. There are times... When this old body, <laughs> this old body, now that I'm in my 40s, is tired of going, is tired of doing, tired of moving on. And let me tell you, you don't have to be in your 40s to feel that way. You can be in your 80s, right? You can be in your 30s or your 20s, and you can just get tired, right? right? You get tired of moving on. 
I want you, to, if you got your Bibles handy, I want you to go to this particular passage. And this passage is going to mean a lot more to you with, how we're, with what we're talking about. Galatians. The book of Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians, chapter 6. You know, those, that's those books that are right after 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. It took me forever to figure it out until, until I had a teacher said, you remember, go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I still remember it that way. Philippians, eat pop. Okay, got it. <laughs> but Galatians, right at the beginning, right after Corinthians. So Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now that's a popular verse, right? That, that verse 9, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. But the verse right before it is so much more important when we're talking about what we're talking about. If we're to carry on in this life, Right? If we're going to carry on, if we're going to continue to do the work of God, if we're going to tend, continue to live and raise our families and be a part of society, if we're going to continue to reach souls for the lost, if we're going to continue feeding His sheep, I'm talking about teaching the children and teaching the adults and ministering here in this church, we have to have the energy to do it. You know, you just don't get up and all of a sudden you, you, you can just do it. You, Galen, you're a Sunday school teacher. You know, sometimes you get weary, you get tired, but you got to have the energy to carry on, to keep doing it, to continue being a Sunday school teacher. You know, I've known some Sunday school teachers that were there for a year, and Galen's been there. How long have you been teaching? 30 years he's been doing Sunday school teacher. And you know what? That energy doesn't come from right here. It doesn't come from this human body. You've got to get a different source. Pastor's been here at this, pastoring this church for 30 years. Before that, he was pastoring some place else. Before that, he was doing a, he was a music minister. Before that, he was a youth minister. And you don't he doesn't get that energy from this from this flesh. It comes from the spirit. And it says in verse eight, if we sow to the flesh, if we sow to the flesh, that is, if we fill ourselves with the things of this world, and whatever that might be, whether it be entertainment whether it be recreation, whether it be sports, whether it be whatever, whatever the world has to offer and it's just filling up our lives. If we fill our reservoirs up with these things and not the things of God, we'll be empty, right? Our gas tank will be running out of fuel and we'll be sputtering to a stop. If that's all we're doing is filling ourselves with the leisure and the recreation and the things of this world, we will run out of gas. But if we sow to the Spirit, like it says there in verse 8, oh man, I love that verse. You know, this verse has just come alive to me. I love how the, the Word can do that. If we sow to the Spirit, God promises in verse number 9 that we will not grow weary in doing the work of the Lord. Amen. Amen. He tells us how. He doesn't just give us a command. Hey, don't be weary. Don't get tired while you're doing the work of the Lord. He's not just commanding you. He tells you, this is how it's done. You sow to the Spirit. You fill your life with the good things of God. And going back to the book of Isaiah, and this is my wife's favorite verse, if we wait upon the Lord, you've heard this verse, those who wait upon the Lord, you've all, probably all have heard it. If we wait upon the Lord, if we fill up our lives with His goodness, He will renew our strength. It's like your car. You fill up with gas. If you don't go back to that gas station after about three or 400 miles, you're going to run out of gas. And if we sow to the Spirit, if we fill our lives with good things, with the good things of God, He renews our spirit. He fills our gas tank again. He fills up our reservoir so that we can have the energy, so that we can generate that electricity. You see, as the good things come into our lives, He is generating the energy that we need to carry on in our life, to carry on with His will and to carry on with His work. And like Isaiah said, He will give us the energy to walk. He will give us the energy to run. He will give us the energy to soar like eagles through our works, 
and through our problems, and through life. Amen. You know, I could go on, I really could, a long time on this topic, because this is a fun topic. And I may come and preach just on this passage, because it's got so much good stuff in it. But I'll just say this. If you're feeling run down, if you're dragging from point A to point B, if you feel like you're just dragging a ball and chain behind you, and that is not a joke for the husbands in this, in this uh, congregation. I'm talking about a real ball where you're like just pulling this anchor behind you. And you feel like you just are having so much trouble getting through life. You're struggling to do what needs to be done. I'll just say this. It's time for you to fill up with the good things of God. Let Him energize you. Don't let the world energize you. Don't go get a monster or a Red Bull. There's a, Get the red blood going through you, alright? Jesus' blood. You get that running through you. Amen. Right? You get that working in your life, and then you have the energy to do things. You fill yourself up with godly things, and He will give you the energy to carry on. And you do that by filling up with the good things of God. The source has filled your reservoir and it's pouring through you and now you got the energy to do it. Lastly, fourth point. And I, this is the most important point of this topic. See, they didn't just build these giant reservoirs and dams up in the Sierra. They didn't, they're not just sitting up there holding water. See, we have... We have these rivers that still come through the valley. And we have these man-made rivers called canals. I remember when Greater Vision came through, Chris Elm on the tenor, my favorite tenor. Love this guy. But we're driving through, and he, we come to Hatch Road, you know, where the, that canal runs along. He goes, what's that river called? And I'm laughing to myself, and I think to myself, these, you know, people that are outside of California have never seen a canal probably. I mean, they, I so, said, oh, that's a canal. And I explained the whole, whole uh, uh, reservoir system and the canal and the river system to them. I did that. <laughs> yeah. So all these Southern Gospel singers come through and they're like, what is, this? what is this? We don't understand. And so we have all these canals, huge canals that we've built, and they go everywhere, right? They go everywhere. And they take the water to where it needs to be. They take them to these areas where we get our water from, to drink, to water our lawns, but they also take them, most importantly, to these farmers, right? Farmers everywhere, up and down the valley. You could go on the 99 from Sacramento all the way down to Bakersfield and never stop seeing farms. It's incredible, it's impressive. And it's because these canal systems are in place. It takes the water that are in the reservoirs and brings them to the place that they're needed. Now, this valley used to be a giant marshland, a wasteland, right? A place that was barely inhabitable. You think 40 million people could fit in California without this water supply being, with, the, with all the ground just being a marshland? There's no way all these people that are here now in this valley, the millions of people that live here in the valley, that could not live here. But for thousands of years, that's how it was. It was this giant marshland. Right? But now look at it. Now that we've put these dams in place, now that we have reservoirs, and now that we have canals coming into this valley, look at it now. Everywhere you look, there are giant fields of corn and vegetable, and there are groves of almonds and orchards full of orange trees and peaches and a hundred different types of fruits that we have here in the valley. And we have produce in this valley year-round, all the time. And all this water behind the dams flows through the rivers and flows through the canals and produces fruit. Are you getting what I'm saying? I think a couple of you catching on. You see, if that water just stayed there, it wouldn't produce a thing in this valley. Listen. If you're filled with the good things of God, don't just be a reservoir. You need to be a river. Hmm? If I can leave you with the most important thought of this message, 
It's this, and I will say it again. Don't be a reservoir. Be a river. If you're being filled up with the fullness of God, don't just let it sit here. Don't let it stay in here. If that reservoir just holds the water and the water doesn't come through, there's no electricity generated, so you have no energy if you just let the good things of God stay in you. But when you let it flow out, then that energy becomes part of you. And guess what? When you become a river and you start taking the water to where it needs to be, then you start seeing the production of fruit in your life. Just like Jesus said, right? We all know the story. By their fruits, you shall know them. And you produce fruits when you're a river. And that water is flowing to where it needs to be. If you're just a body of water that sits and has no outlet, you know what that is? It's a swamp. And swamps stink. I ask you this, this evening, do you stink? Huh? Don't stink. Don't be a swamp where the water just accumulates. If you go to Israel today, if you go over to the Middle East, go to Israel today, or if you were to go there 3,000 years ago, this particular topography has not changed. There are two huge bodies of water in Israel. And if you've studied the Bible for any amount of time, you know what they are. The first is the Sea of Galilee. And that's where all the miracles of Jesus happen, right? Where it walks in the water, and then that when the when the disciples pull in their nets and they have all these fish. And Jesus calms the storm on the water. This was a sea teeming and is teeming with fish. And these, this is the, the body of water where Jesus did his miracles. This is a body full of life. And there's another body. It's called the Dead Sea. I always thought that was a cool name when I was a kid. But really it's not. It's the Dead Sea. And would you like to know why it's dead? They call it the Dead Sea? It's dead. There's nothing in it. Nothing lives in it. Fish can't live in it. Bacteria can't live. It's full, so full of salt and minerals. The bacteria has only certain, certain types of bacteria can survive. And it's just dead. There's nothing good about the Dead Sea. Right? Just, you got the... A sea of life, Sea of Galilee, and you have the Dead Sea. And do you know what the difference is? One has an outlet, and the other does not. The Sea of Galilee channels into the River of Jordan. And that river goes all the way through Israel, and guess what they do with that water? Produce fruit all over Israel. And then it gets to the Dead Sea, and it goes nowhere. And it just sits there. And it is dead. Are you a sea of life? Or are you a sea of death? Is the water flowing out of you? That's been given to you? Or are you just holding it in for yourself? And now you're this stinky swamp. Don't hold in all of the good things of God that you've accumulated. You could come to church here every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and spend time in Bible. But if you don't let it flow out of your life, you're a swamp. You're a sea of death. Be a river. Be a sea of life. You need to let these good things that you're bringing into your reservoir, you need to let them out. All right? If you've grown up in church, if you've grown up and you know all these Bible stories, I was telling this to my cousin the other day, you need to be teaching others. Don't hold all the stories in for yourself. You need to be telling somebody else about these stories. You know what? We've got plenty of classes here at Richland Faith. We've got Sunday school classes. We've got kids club classes, youth classes. We would love to see Royal Rangers and Mission X. It's a boys and a girls club where they learn different tasks and trades and learn about the outdoors, and, but they learn about missions as well. We would love to have that. But you know what? We don't have the people here. If you have received that in your life. If you've accumulated the good things, you need to be a river. You need to be sharing these things. You need to be involved with the little ones that are here in this church. Or you need to be involved with the adults and teaching them. If God has blessed you financially, don't hold it in. 
This church needs your support. There are things that this church wants to do to improve what we do in this community, to reach out to this community. You can be a blessing to this church financially. You can be a blessing to the people who are sitting in these pews. I bet you know some of the people that are here that need a financial miracle. You might be the one that God's calling you to say, I have filled your reservoir up. It's time for you to be a river. There are missionaries that come into this church that need financial support so they can go across the world and take the gospel to a land of people who have never heard the gospel. There are college ministries, the Chi Alpha Ministries, they are reaching people all over the world because they all come from all over the world into the universities and into the colleges. And they are reaching to them. And those people that they reach are going back to their countries and reaching out. These are ministries that we should support. There are radio stations, radio broadcasters that need your support. There are ministers. If you listen to Focus on the Family on the way to work like, like I do, well, there are other ministers that need your support as they reach out and spread the gospel. Do you like drama? And I don't know, I don't, maybe there's somebody in here that grew up and they love drama and they were part of plays in high school or college. We would love to put a drama program together. We would. Do you have some musical talent? Man, we want you up on stage. Well, there's Kathy, there's me. We would love a guitar player, a drummer, a bass player, somebody with a tuba, <laughs> whatever. We want you to not be a reservoir, but to be a river. If God has blessed you with something, if He has put something in your life, it needs to flow out. You know, it's really simple. Don't hold anything in. It's just that simple. Don't hold it in. If God has put it in you, you let it flow out. If God's been good to you, it's time for that reservoir to flow out through your rivers and produce the fruit that God wants you to produce. And that fruit is what? It is salvation. It is salvation. Just like in John where Jesus said to the Samaritan woman who came to the well, and he says, the water I give you will become a fountain of water, a fountain of life. It will be a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's what we are today. We are filling our reservoirs up and we are rivers. And we are pouring this in to the people around us and to the nations around us so that it can spring forth into a well of everlasting life. And I encourage you tonight, I really do, let the living waters flow from your life into this world. Be a reservoir, but don't let it stop there. Be a river and let these good things pour out of your life. Amen? Amen. Pastor?